Now it's time for us to take a look at trees and shrubs. In your Woody Ornamentals manual, there's quite a bit for you to read. So I recommend on your own spending some time on the selection factors, the growth habits, the function that different Woody Ornamentals can play in the landscape, designing for maintenance, care and establishment, read up on Woody Vines and do an overview of the disease, insects, and the other pests and problems that can happen to our trees and shrubs. In this lecture, we're going to focus on an introduction about woody plants, talk about purchasing, planting, caring for, and finally pruning. So first of all, let's start off. What is a tree? If you're unsure, I've got a picture of one in right here for you. And if you look at it, think about the different things that make a tree a tree. First of all, their tissues are woody. They're not herbaceous like what we'd find with daylilies or hostas, but those stems and branches have lignified, create, giving, a, giving them a woodiness to them. And this allows them to withstand uh, a lot of the environment that they encounter, the wind, the rain, snow, what have you. Trees have two different types of growth. There's primary growth, which occurs at the tips of the branches and which make the tree taller and the branches longer and that occurs with the terminal buds. But woody plants also have what's known as a cambium, or this layer of cells that surrounds the entire plant that as it grows, it produces phloem on the outside of the cambium, xylem on the inside, and each year a new ring of xylem forms, which will give our trees uh, the growth rings that we would see if we were to do a cross section. That's a secondary growth, and that's what makes the branches and stems thicker in the tree. Trees are perennials. We tend to just assume it, but they should be living for more than three years. In fact, they have the uh, potential in some cases to live for hundreds of years if the environmental conditions are right. They are, real, they are relatively large in size. So here we're looking at a tree that's much bigger than the house. And they're able to compartmentalize. And we'll talk about this just a little when we talk about pruning, but this is a tree's way of fending off problems that get into the woody tissues. Now, where do trees normally come from? The simple answer is a forest. And what's the qualities of a forest? Well, there's a lot of trees, there's leaves on the ground, the trees are really close together, and it's in this environment that the majority of our trees are programmed to grow. This what gives us tall, sh uh, straight trunks as they're all striving to get to the light at the top. The shade that the lower branches occur causes those branches to die off, so they self-prune. They're also self-mulching because of the leaves falling to the ground. Those roots are protected. Um, this is the way the vast majority of our trees come, and it's this we need to keep in mind as we're trying to establish them in our lawns and landscapes. But trees can come from other locations. They're savannas. In Wisconsin, we're known for our oak savannas, which is, these would be far spaced oak trees um, growing in grasses, which not all trees can do that as successfully as what the oaks can. We also have maybe confined trees in some upland areas, um, in some rocky areas, etc. Um, but for the most part, think of trees growing in a forest. So what's the difference between a tree and a shrub? Well, a tree is going to typically have a single stem. It can have, you know, few to many, but typically single stem. And a shrub is, is um, definitely more than that. So it can be a few to many. Um, both are woody plants. And, um, you know, basically what it boils down to is all on how you prune it. Because this picture I have here, you may want to call it a shrub. What you have to do is recognize it. it's a linden tree. It's supposed to be a single uh, stem. It's supposed to be a really tall plant, but due to an accident with a snowplow, um, it's become a shrub. So that's why we call it woody plants, because there's a spectrum between shrubs to trees, and, and sometimes it's not too clear. So let's do a quick overview of a tree's bi biology. We have the part that's above ground. We have the canopy, which is all the leaves. They're responsible for do, doing photosynthesis, that is converting carbon dioxide um, 
into sugars and they give off oxygen. So they need CO2 and O2. We also have the trunk that's above ground and it's there for structural support and protection of everything inside. It's responsible for moving water and nutrients from the roots up to the leaves and it's able to store sugars, abbreviated CHO. Roots are the below ground portion, that's where the water and nutrients are absorbed. And what we want to remember that the roots need oxygen and they have to get that oxygen through the pore space found in the soils. Remember, a good healthy soil has a portion of those of it being oxygen or airspace. And if the, that soil is compacted or overly saturated with water, there could be no air, no oxygen, and that can cause problems to those roots, thus the whole tree. So the first thing we need to recognize is that the tree's root system is not a mirror image of the top part of the tree. Those roots are not growing down like a carrot or mimicking the top. Those roots are actually growing outwards in the upper foot of the soil where they're able to absorb the water and nutrients and move through the pore space um, in order to get the oxygen and water they need. Those roots can extend two, three, maybe four times the height of the tree depending on the soil type and the tree species. So think of the root system as a pancake that's spreading out from the trunk of the tree, not a carrot that's going down. Trees offer many benefits. Um, from the environmental point of view, they filter out air pollutants. Those leaves capture airborne particles and help pull them out, making it easier for us to breathe. The leaves also reduce storm water runoff by intercepting rain during a storm event. And instead of that rain coming down and hitting the roads and paved surfaces and flushing into the sewers and waterways, those trees will have that water accumulate, run down the branches, and guide it towards the ground where it can actually infiltrate into the soil and be recharged that way. Trees are responsible for countering the urban heat island effect. In our cities, we use a lot of paved surfaces, concrete, blacktop, etc. During the day, they can collect heat from the sun, causing our areas to warm up mm, three to five degrees more so than the surrounding areas. By having trees through their shade and their evapotranspiration cooling, they can help counter that urban heat island effect and, and have a cooling effect. In more of the rural areas, trees provide a nice windbreak, and this is especially important in the winter. As winter winds come whipping across our landscape, trees can actually slow the winds or divert the winds away from our homes so um, drafts aren't as prominent and we have better um, heating of our homes. Trees also have an economic benefit. Research has shown that they can increase property values. So when you compare homes of similar make and model and age, the presence or absence of trees can affect their value. Having trees present can increase it. Research has also shown that trees can attract business and customers, keep them in a location longer, and can actually get people to pay more money for products. It's um, very interesting work that's being done. And I at least have seen across the state quite a few businesses that have been incorporated this psychology into their landscaping to have kind of this upscale feel to their shopping centers with the use of trees. Um, and as alluded to with the environmental benefits, uh, trees do reduce energy costs through shading, through windbreaks, and they can help save on energy bills. Trees also offer a bunch of social benefits. We know they beautify the landscape um, but they improve public health, um, they increase community pride, reduce violent behavior, and they create a re recreational area where we like to go and relax. And for anybody interested in hort therapy and the connection of healing and nature, um, the, the research there expands greatly on, on the benefits that trees and plants can bring to our lives and our communities. So I'm showing you a chart of some research that was oh, bantied about a couple years ago. Some people now question it, but I think it just makes a really good point 
um, about the longevity of trees in the places we live. If we look at trees and in the average city site, they're living about 32 years. In our best city sites, trees are living about 60 years. And in our rural location, trees are averaging about 150 years. In our downtown areas, trees have an average lifespan of seven years. Now there's a lot of problems going on with trees, um, especially in our urban areas. There's stress. Um, there's can be uh, too much water, not enough. Too much nutrients, not enough. Soil compaction, soil disruption, pollution. Then we have our insects and diseases that can get into the trees. And then we've just got the way we take care of trees and, and not take care of trees and inappropriately take care of trees. All this starts to add up and put stress on the tree. And after the tree gets so much stress, it just says, I'm done with it, I'm dying, and you can see it's reduction in vigor and finally death. The really telling part is that downtown area and trees, uh, the average lifespan of trees being seven years. Where we, where we need trees the most, where it's the most paved and we're wanting to attract business and customers, um, trees are having a really hard time. And we, as the tree practitioners need to understand what trees need to have in order to survive in those areas and many urban forestry departments are incorporating things such as structural soils and definitely putting the right tree in the right spot and coming in and doing the proper care to help expand that um, and hopefully with uh, more urban forestry programs developing in towns and people understanding the value that trees can bring to their communities um, the professionals out there can help shift these numbers um, more to the positive. Also, too, master gardeners becoming more aware of proper tree care and helping educate the public can help shift these numbers to, for the better. So what's wrong with this picture? You know, this is definitely a wrong tree for this location. And, you know, this is one of the things that we see all the time and, and why we're seeing such horrible longevity numbers for trees in urban areas. Now here's a silver maple that was planted years ago and now it's just outgrown this location. Um, it's not good for the sidewalk, it's not good for the road, it's definitely not good for the tree and it's actually becoming what we call a hazard tree where this is a weak point along the trunk and during a windstorm, rainstorm, or heavy snow event we could probably get failure and this tree tree or part of the tree or whole tree could fall on a house or a passerby and cause damage or death and this is preventable here's another thing that is preventable uh, these trees did not plant themselves under the power lines they were planted there by a person wrong tree for this location because they're growing too tall and they're getting into the power lines then we've made a bad situation worse by coming in and doing inappropriate pruning by topping them which has caused this witch brewing effect to form, um, causing more branches to form which need to be pruned. And as we'll see later, um, this type of pruning can actually lead to decay problems in the tree, making them hazardous. Probably the best thing for this situation is to remove those trees and to not replant them or replant them with something that's going to be a small stature tree that won't interfere with those power lines. I always like it when people come into the office in the oh, about August and they start commenting on how some trees are starting to have early fall color. Um, I always just kind of cringe when I hear that because what they don't understand is that those are trees under stress. Early fall coloration in a tree is a cry for help that this tree is having problems of some sort. Um, it could be insects, could be disease, could be construction damage, who knows, but it is not a tree in good shape. In this picture, we do see early fall coloration on this um, white ash. We can also look at it and we can see how thin the canopy is. We can see right through it. These are all signs of a tree having problems. Trees can get cracks and suckers growing from them. Um, on this picture, we see both. Um, this seam that is growing up the tree is called a frost crack and there's several theories out there as to how they are caused. Uh, we will get to my theory of it in a minute. Um, the other thing we're seeing are suckers 
that are coming off the base and this is the tree trying to survive trying to make more of itself and in doing so it's just growing more stems off the base functionally this works for the tree but aesthetically it may not work for us trees that are planted improperly planted too deep that have decay at the base um, are going to be likely to blow over and what we have to recognize is when a tree is in full leaf that is a large sail that will catch the wind normal healthy trees can take wind gusts up to 70 75 miles per hour or greater trees that have not been planted correctly or that have problems have been found to fail at speeds of 50 to 55 miles per hour here we can see how this tree just kind of socketed right out of the ground a lot of this comes down to planting and the formation of what we call girdling roots and here we're looking at girdling roots cutting across the trunk of this tree girdling roots are a tree's own roots that are growing across the trunk compressing into the trunk and cutting off the water and nutrients that are to be moved up from the roots to the leaves uh, keep in mind that the xylem and phloem that is moving water and nutrients is right underneath the bark and that these roots as they're compressing into it are choking that off and this usually leads to a very slow painful painful for you um, death of the tree um, but we're going to get into this more so there can also be many 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 more problems with their trees so i'm not even talk about insects or disease today um, i'm going to talk about the things that we do wrong to our trees so first of all let's start off by picking the right plant the cheapest thing at the garden center is not necessarily the right thing there's three, three things you need to consider when selecting. You need to consider your environment that you have, the cultural requirements of the plant you want, and then finally the function and the landscape that this plant is to serve. So let's start with environment. This is the ground you have, the sun that reaches that spot, the moisture levels, etc. cetera. Uh, take into consideration uh, the sun shade mix, your soil type and drainage, your soil pH. Keep in mind of both above and below ground utility lines. What are the surrounding structures that you need to consider? Um, sight lines you want to preserve or disrupt, etc. For cultural requirements, this is where you're thinking of the tree. Uh, what's its cold hardiness? Is it uh, for your zone? And that's for both cold and heat hardiness, mind you. What are the light requirements? Is it a tree that requires full sun or is it shade tolerant? Is it tolerant of high pHs or does it require something on the acidic side? How big will it get and how fast will it get there? Fast growing trees to, um, are notoriously weak wooded and require a lot of pruning, mind you. Is the tree messy? Does it drop a lot of branches? Does it produce a lot of fruit that makes a mess? Is there a disease or insect problem you need to be aware of and can you avoid that by getting one that's resistant? There might be some other things you need to consider. Um, and finally though, um, the function in the landscape. Do you need a big shade tree? Do you need a plant that's gonna screen out your neighbor's jacuzzi? Do you want a focal point in your yard? What is it that you want? Consider all of this. And most importantly, find a plant that matches the environment. If you can get a plant that can grow in the environment you have, it's gonna take care of most of the problems it's gonna encounter. So when you go to the nursery and you, and you pick, try to pick something up, uh, take a look at it. Make sure it's healthy, make sure it's free of broken branches, that it's got nice healthy buds, that it's got a good central leader or, or the potential for one. Uh, make sure there's a good array of branches going up and down the tree and around a tree. Try to avoid them all being clustered at one spot. Uh, make sure the root ball's been maintained. You know, make sure it's not been too dry, make sure it's not cracked. Um, a good thing to look for is um, trees at nurseries that are covered in mulch and that are watered versus sitting out on blacktop and dry. Um, look at how they're taking care of them while they're sitting on the nursery yard. Um, 
And again, try to get things that have been mulched and watered. That's, that's a good chance you're going to be getting a plant that's in good shape. Here's some problems I've encountered over the years. Uh, here is a tree that when it was pulled off the truck as it was being delivered, the delivery guys scraped it up. If you look real closely, you can see there's a little bit of green under the bark. Photosynthetic tissue is just not in the leaves. On our young trees and on our thin bark trees, there are cells underneath the bark that are able to do photosynthesis. And the more photosynthetic material you have on the tree, the more sugars it'll produce, the more roots it'll put in the ground, and the faster it's going to establish itself. So avoid doing damage to any of the materials because it's all important. Here's a picture of, of a root ball problem. And as I just said earlier, make sure you get a plant that has a root ball that looks to be in good shape. Um, which one of these is not like the other? You know, this one here just screams problem to me and maybe the price is right and you do want to take a chance with it but otherwise if it is full price I, I think I would gravitate to one of these root balls that look in better shape also check out the branches check out the trunks if you can look at the roots look for disease or insect problems you've got enough insect and disease problems in your yard already do not bring in something that you don't have luckily for us Wisconsin has a strong nursery inspection program that is doing a lot of this work for us but still it, it never hurts for us to keep our eyes open so when I started with extension and actually going beyond that and hearing how people planted trees it always consisted something of digging a hole roughly the size of the root ball to the depth of the root ball plopping it in there um, there was always some debate about whether or not you remove the burlap or the twine because it broke down, um, what have you. And I actually still see many places, many professionals still recommend planting trees this way. And the point of it is, is don't. Um, what we've found over the years, especially in the period since we've replanted all the loss of all the elms we came in and did a massive replanting of all these other things and that those plants really didn't live up to their potential and basically as we were exhuming the um, their graves and uh, examining the bodies uh, we realized there was quite a bit of quite a bit of problems uh, originated with how they were planted so research was done and basically it boils down to is been found that trees planted this way will lead to long-term tree health problems. So what's going on with this old way? If we look at this picture, we see here's trunk and here's the roots. And as I said earlier, the trunk is there to protect the tree um, from the environment. That's the above ground environment where it's raining and windy and, and sunlight. In this situation, we put it underground in a constantly dark, constantly moist environment where microbes are going to try to eat into the bark and the moisture is going to cause things to rot. And that's where problems such as frost cracks start to occur. Um, they begin through decay pockets that start to form on the bark and then through the freezing and thawing that occurs in our climate, the crack just perpetuates itself up the tree and um, we wind up with these big seams going up and down our trees also is because this is buried it's the trees response to throw off those suckers that we see and try to survive that way so pretty much we can avoid all that by not putting the trunk below ground or at least minimize it the other thing is the roots by planting the tree deep um, those roots are going to have to struggle to get to the oxygen they need to survive Remember where roots want to grow. They want to grow in the top part of the soil where there's pores for them to grow through and to get the oxygen, water, and nutrients they need. When we've planted them down deep, they are going to grow to where these roots are going to grow to where there's more oxygen. That's usually the upper layers. So already we start to see these little roots growing upwards. Well, that's fine because that's going to support the tree in the short run. But fast forward 15, 20 years, and as this trunk has gotten thicker and these roots have gotten larger, they've now come into contact with one another, and we've wound up with that girdling root situation. So just some more horrible pictures of trees and stress. Um, here's some uh, maples that were planted too deep, and we're starting to see the dieback in this guy right here. 
the bare branches up top. Um, this is the beginning of problems in trees. Usually you see it about 20 to 30 years after it's been planted. And this tree's having trouble getting water going up its trunk. It's, it's got girdling roots when you go up and look at it. And it's, the problem's going to manifest itself in the furthest branches at the top and on the outside where it's having difficulty moving water. So that's the beginning of the problem. And here it's just further along. It's really thin, early fall coloration. Um, both these trees were actually removed within two years of this picture. So let's talk about how to do things right. To do things right, what we need to do is position the tree in the ground so all the trunk tissue is above ground and the root tissue is at the natural soil grade where the roots can grow outward. And as time passes, the roots and tr trunk can grow without coming in contact with one another. Now to do that, what we need to do is recognize the part of the tree that's called the root flare. This is this bell-shaped area that we see on these trees. It's the transition zone from the trunk tissue up here to the root tissue down below. This is the part of, tree, of the tree that at the time of planting needs to be at the natural soil grade. So with that, let's move into the different types of planting materials we can encounter. There's bare root, ball and burlap, which we call B&B, &B, and container grown. There's pros and cons with each of these, so let's start off with bare root. First of all, with bare root, they are very lightweight because there's no soil weighting down those roots. Um, they're easy to find where that root flare is at because there's no soil getting in the way, and you can assess the health of the root system um, just by pulling it out of the, the bin that it's being sold in, taking a look at those roots, and, and you can see them. The drawback is these trees have to be dormant when you purchase them for all this to be going on. Because there is no soil in contact with those roots, these trees cannot be actively growing, actively transpiring. So it's going to be in the dormant season um, when these trees start to become available. Um, but they're, they got to be purchased at a time where they're dormant, but the ground's going to start to thaw. So this is talking about a very limited window of time. We're talking March, April, early May. Um, so you have a reduced planting time. Also because the process of bare root planting is so traumatic on the tree, you're going to get a limited selection. Not everything can take the trauma and stress of being bare rooted. For B&B, &B, this is where we're going to get the wide selection of trees. Most things to come as ball and burlap. You can pretty much get an instantaneous landscape by getting some really large trees, and you can plant them pretty much any time of the year that the ground is workable. Drawbacks, because the soil is in contact with those roots, these things can be very heavy. Um, I've wrestled with 500 pound root balls before, and I know they do come larger. Um, because they are so heavy, there's a lot of manpower and equipment required to move these things around, so their expenses start to go up. And when it comes time for planting, you're going to have to dissect that root ball in order to find the root flare, in order to plant it at the proper grade. Containerized, it's like the combination of both B&B &B and um, bare root. It's where you get the wide selection, like what you find with B&B, &B, but it's going to be the relatively cheaper cost. Um, not quite as cheap as bare root, but significantly cheaper than container. And like the B&B, &B, you get a large window of time to plant. Big drawback, however, is round pots, round circling roots, if you are not careful. Um, when it does come time for planting, what you may find yourself doing is teasing these roots apart in order to find the root flare and untangling any circling roots you may encounter. So now let's pick up a shovel and talk about that hole. And digging the hole is going to be the same in all three cases. What we want is a wide hole, not a shallow hole, or not a deep hole like what we saw with the first old way example, but we want a really wide hole, something about three to five times wider than the root system. We want to dig a hole just deep enough to put the root flare at the natural soil grade, or if we're going to screw up, put it one to two inches higher. So we're talking about a wide yet shallow hole. We want to slope and roughen the sides. Um, if you've ever taken a shovel through the soil, you can might have seen the glazed surface that is left behind. 
Um, if a root is trying to grow and hits that glazed surface, it may not be able to penetrate it and it may turn and just grow to the side. We don't want that. We want to invite those roots out into the surrounding soil. And because we could be planting 500 pound B&B trees, we want to leave the bottom of the hole undisturbed. We, won't, we don't want to dig the hole too deep and go, oops, let's throw some more soil into it and then put the tree on it and have it settle. So here again, wide shallow holes, slope and rough in the sides, leave the bottom of the hole undisturbed, deep enough only to put the root flare at the natural soil grade. Okay, so now that the tree is in the hole, we want to backfill with soil that's native to the site. No amendments, no fertilizers, no compost. We want those roots to grow in the soil that's native to the site. We want to gently firm in the soil with our hands. Um, so backfill, get dirty, break up large particles and work them around, but don't start stepping on the soil to compact it down. We want to preserve the pore space so air and water can get down to those roots. And any large pockets of space that are left in there um, will be removed with the first thorough watering that comes when we're all done. So let's talk about bare root. Here's an example of bare root. Um, some a little bit of anatomy here. Most of our bare root trees are going to be grafted. That is, there's going to be some sort of seed grown rootstock with a cultivar grafted onto the top. And here we're looking at the scion. And down below this is the rootstock. And where the two meet, this is the bud graft union because they were grafted. And if we look here, this is the root flare. We're also seeing all sorts of other roots. And because this is bare root and it was kept in a cooler and we want to keep these roots moist, this is covered in mulch. And it's covered too deep in mulch, but it's, it's, you know, it's only in the cooler. And this tree will respond by growing some roots, these adventitious roots up here. Do not confuse those as anything important. When it comes time for planting, you may just want to nip those off. You want to focus on the root flare that's right here being at natural soil grade. So let's talk about digging this hole. We want to dig it three to five times wider than this root system and only deep enough to put the root flare at the natural soil grade. So if we look at this example, which I'm going to admit this is like the world's worst example, but it is what it is. Um, it's a tree. It needs love too. It needed a home. Um, it still is a worst example because of this funny thick root out here. The root flare is right about here. How deep do you think this hole needs to be? A foot? Two foot? Well, if you said a couple inches, you were close. Um, because this is being, being the root flare, this hole is only about four to five inches deep. But it's three to five times wider than the root system. The sides have been sloped and roughened. The tree's been placed in the middle. We're now untangling those roots to have them radiate out, out around the trunk into the planting hole. Backfill with the soil native to the site. No amendments, no fertilizers. Loosely work, or loosely work that soil in with your hands. Don't pack it in with your feet. Maintain that pore space for air and water movement. And uh, because this hole wasn't deep, we're going to need to stake this tree. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But when I said this was the world's ugliest example, it's right there. Could have considered removing it, but then it's just one more root that we're losing that will support this tree. My advice to you is don't buy things as ugly as this at the nursery. Let's move on to B&B, &B, ball and burlapped. Somewhere in there is the root flare, and it's going to be your job to find it. Um, so what most people do is they take their hand and they start to slide it down the trunk and they feel for where that bud graft union that will be in there. And when they feel that, they can then estimate that it's about six to eight inches below. And then from here down to yonder, that's about how deep you may need to dig the hole. It's a little harder to do B and B trees, but with practice and building up some confidence, you can do it too. So just take a look at this example. The yellow arrow is pointing to the artificial soil line established by the nursery, so the top of the ball. The orange arrow is pointing to the bud graft union. And then that green arrow is pointing to the root flare. So if we planted that as is the old way, that much of the trunk would have been put below ground. 
with careful excavation, we have removed the top of the root ball to expose the trunk. A lot of people have said, don't damage the root ball, don't mess with the root, root ball, you're going to damage roots. Well, there is some truth to that. But with the way that these are harvested from the nurseries, those roots are going to be in the bottom of the root ball, not the top. So gently excavate through the top, pulling the soil back until you get down to that root flare. Dig a hole three to five times wider, rough and slope in the sides, put it to the depth of the root flare, which, yeah, as we said, it's going to be a little bit of a guessing game, but if you're going to err, err on planting it too high, not too deep. Remove the twine, remove the burlap, remove the wire basket. Some people will say it breaks down. I'm going to say the tree is going to grow faster than what it will break down, so get it out of the way. If you can't get it off completely, at least get it so it's laying at the bottom of the hole and the roots can grow over it. So we've gone as far as to remove the burlap and basket. We've started to pull back some of the soil that doesn't have roots in it so we can expose the trunk and root flare. We're backfilling with soil native to the site. Um, again, we're not tamping it down. We want to maintain pore space in there. And if we just take a look at this tree, that would have been the top of the root ball. That is the amount of trunk that is now properly exposed with our proper planting method. Oh, I guess I do have some more horrible pictures of trees just being tortured. Um, here's a specimen that did not have the burlap removed. Here we're seeing this little hula skirt from the burlap. And look at how these roots have had to fight to get out of there and how they're girdling in that. And here's a horrible picture of a cage and wire that was left on to a planting specimen. Um, if this stuff does break down, well, it didn't break down fast enough to let this plant live. So our final method of planting is with containerized. Uh, first of all, we start off by removing the plant from the pot which that can be more of a challenge than, than what you think. Because um, if you ever go to a nursery and you buy these things, you, you do know that there's holes in the bottom of the pot that allows for drainage. And if these plants have been grown in these spots for a long time, you may have roots that are coming out of those holes, almost like big pigtails coming out of the pots. So you've got to get them out. And your question is, do I cut those roots and just pull it out, or do I cut the pot? Well, it's going to be up to you. Um, my preference is I cut the roots and I reuse the pot for another landscaping project, but that is just my personal preference. But either way, plant comes out of the pot. The other thing we have to realize with this is what we're looking at here in this picture is not a root ball covered in soil. This is a root ball covered in compost with a beautiful soil amendment. What does not go into a planting hole? Compost or soil amendments. This, if planted as is, can really cause a lot of problems with the water relations in your soil. It may suck up too much moisture, causing the roots to drown, or depending on your soil type, vice versa, all the water will get sucked away. What we need to do is gently tease this off the roots in the process, looking for the root flare and undoing any circling, potentially girdling roots we encounter. So with containerized, in some cases, you are bare root planting an actively growing tree. And if you're going to do that, that means you need to work fast and efficiently and do this in the shade and do it when it's cool so this tree doesn't encounter more stress than what it's already going through. So we've, we've gently removed those compost from those roots and we've began to, unte to tease them apart and tie the knots we're finding. The hole three to five times wider than the root system to a depth that's going to put the root flare at the natural soil grade, which in this case is just inches. We're going to pull those roots so that they're radiating around the tree. We're trying to invite them into the soil surrounding the site. As we can see in this picture, those roots are actually extending beyond the planting hole. So we can either dig a trench to bring them out or we can cut them off. It's up to you. Backfill with soil native to the site, no amendments, no uh, compost. And what we see here is top arrow is pointing to the top of the pot. So this is the artificial soil line by, from the nursery. Here is the bud graft union. And this one right down here is the root flare, which 
would have been at the bottom of the pot with the way this plant was prepared. Again, as you're teasing those apart, look for those circling roots. If you can't untangle them, you might need to consider cutting them. But remember, every time you're cutting the root, you are cutting the plant's ability to absorb water and nutrients. So try to do it sparingly. Repeats. Little note on shrubs. Shrubs don't have flares, they have crowns. And the difference being, instead of one or two stems growing up, we have a whole bunch growing up at one point, kind of giving it the appearance of a crown. Having these things planted too deeply is not much of an issue. Um, haven't encountered big turmoil from these things being planted too deep, no big controversies at growing conventions, arborist conventions, etc. What I find to be the biggest problem is the fact that what these are planted in is, again, compost. And the, where I see the problem occurring is the new home construction where it's that stereotypical cornfield now turned into a subdivision and it's really heavy compacted clay soils the landscape contractor went out there and dug these gumdrop holes and just plopped these in there so there it's this really spongy root mass surrounded by compacted clay and then people wonder why things die well it's a mismatch in the soil types and that water relations problem where uh, the water just gets sucked out of the root ball and that to have success with planting shrubs and anything in this type of, of condition, you want to ensure good soil root contact. So you will see recommendations to butterfly the rooting ball, meaning splitting it open from the base. You will hear people say score the sides um, to sever the roots, and tr then when you plant, you can work on getting soil into that spot. All these are are um, can be successful ways of planting these plants. Um, just keep in mind, good soil root contact, however you can get it. Everything I've talked about is also applicable to our evergreens. In this picture, this is a landscape shot from some master gardeners in a class of mine. They were having problems with these pines that they had transplanted several years ago. They were slowly dying, as, as what you can see here, and they would bring le needles and pictures to class, and I, I couldn't tell, so finally I said, I'm going to be in your neighborhood one day. Let me stop by. And when I looked at the tree, you could see the lowest whirl of branches coming up from underground. They had them put in with a spade, um, one of those big trucks that would come in and put them in, and in doing so, they were put too deep. That's the, that's the problem. So for post-planting care, probably the number one thing you can do is make sure that tree gets enough water. And for most species, we're talking about one to two inches of water per week for that first growing season. One inch of water is enough to percolate down through your soil about 10 to 12 inches, which where do roots want to grow? In the top foot of soil. And about once per week will meet its requirements. How you put that water on is going to be up to you. You can use a drip hose, you can use a lawn sprinkler, you can stand there soaking it yourself. Um, I like to use a sprinkler that a fan sprinkler that slowly goes back and forth across the yard. Um, I throw a container out there uh, to collect the water. When I see there's one inch of water in there, I know I've put down enough. Um, my neighbors think I'm watering the grass, but I'm actually watering the trees. I'm, I'm not too worried about it. I want to talk a little bit, though, about transplant shock that goes along with this. Um, because when we are transplanting trees, they are under stress, and they do need to overcome that stress. And until they um, overcome that stress, they may just kind of sit somewhat dormant in, in your landscape. Um, smaller trees recover from transplant shock better than bigger ones. So a nice rule of thumb to follow is if you have a one inch caliper tree, so at the base, basically right above the root flare, if it's about a one inch or less, it will grow enough roots in one year or one growing season to fully support itself and it should re resume normal growth the next season. So a small tree should should in one year get enough roots out there to support itself and start growing. You plant a two inch caliper tree, it's going to take about two years for it to get enough roots out there to support itself so it can start growing. You plant a three inch caliper tree, it's going to take about three years to get enough roots out. You plant a four inch caliper tree, it'll take about four years for 
enough roots to get out there to support it. Well, the moral of the story is this. If you have a 1-inch caliper tree and a 4-inch caliper tree of the same species planted at the same time, you will find that the 1-inch caliper tree will establish itself faster and start growing and in three years catch up to the larger tree and be the same size of it because that 4-inch caliper tree has taken four years to establish itself before it would start growing. So bigger isn't always better. Smaller ones can be more cost effect, uh, more cost effective and um, transplant better. So keep that in mind when at the garden center. You may have noticed that our planting holes were not very deep. And in order to keep our trees from falling over, we may need to stake them to give them support so they do not fall over. The important thing to note with this is we want to secure the tree loosely. We do not want to stake the tree so tightly that it does not move at all. We want to stake it loosely. So as the wind blows, the tree shakes, it wiggles, it moves back and forth. And in doing so, that movement triggers growth to occur along the trunk, triggers more secondary growth to occur on those tissues that will be the supporting portion of the tree. If you stake that tree so tightly, there is no trigger to cause that growth to occur. So all that growth is going to be to make the tree taller, make the branches longer, make it top heavy with a weak base. And that's what we don't want because I've seen many trees break and snap once that um, support system has been removed. Stake them loosely. You want them to wiggle around. Uh, drive the stakes. All you need is two outside the root system, doesn't matter, north, south, east, west, whatever. You just need to drive them in so they're in the ground itself and not in the root ball so the whole thing falls over. And you want to use strapping material that is wide so there is no pressure or abrasion occurring at one spot as that tree is moving um, gently in its straps. If you go to garden centers these days, you can actually find tree planting straps. They're, they're fairly cheap. You can reuse them time and time again and they do a whole lot better than the wire through a garden hose um, that if done too tightly can actually do some damage to trees. Remove after one growing season, um, especially if it's a small tree. By that time it should have enough roots out to support itself. But if you do find or feel that the tree needs a little extra support, rearrange everything and give it another year and come back and check then. So here's the schematic of what it could be. So we have our tree, and here we're using the, an example of the wide strapping material. Um, two poles driven outside the tree. They don't need to be as tall as the tree. They just need to be about one-third the height of the tree. Um, and we're using a wire to go through the grommet here on, on the strap. Check after one year, and again, keep it staked loosely. Here's an example from the city of Madison. I've seen it used in other locations around the state, but it's using some sort of strapping material that's just doubled back on itself and stapled. And that is enough to hold the tree upwards, keep it from falling over, but still give it plenty of wiggle room and be soft enough that it's not gonna damage the bark. See, the whole wire through the garden hose thing kind of is iffy to me because if it's left on too long, left on too tightly, we're essentially just going to be girdling the tree like any root from deep planting wood. So do be cautious. Now let's address the mulching material. What does make a good mulch? There's texture to consider. We like things that are actually a medium textured best. We want things that have a nutrient value, meaning organic. It has carbon in it um, as compared to rock. Rock is bad. Um, a lot's going to depend on what's available to you. What's in your area? Is it hardwood? That's what I use. And your own personal aesthetics. Do you want something that's been colored? Do you want something that's been twice shredded? Or are you okay just going to the area compost site and getting whatever's free and available? That's up to you. But before we go on, I want to just go back to where do trees come from? As we said at the beginning of this lecture, trees like to come from a forested setting. And what are the qualities of a forest? There's a lot of trees, they're really close together, and when those leaves fall, squirrels do not come through and rake them up into neat little piles so the city can come pick them up. No. 
those leaves are left on the ground to form a duff layer that is used for insulating the roots. They break down and provide nutrients to the leaves. They help secure moisture in the ground. That debris layer on the ground helps trees grow. That's the way trees are programmed to be. But let's just look at some of the things we do to trees. So the next picture over, it's a picture of the University of Wisconsin Arboretum, an internationally known place of growing trees. Beautiful place, lots of healthy trees, but what's different that you see? No mulch. These trees are given space, but they're doing fine out there. So something that's different. Let's move over to the next picture. This could very easily be the street you live on. What's different? We've added a road. We call it impervious surfaces. So now we are looking at trees that are growing in grass, no mulch, and they don't have a lot of space for those roots to grow. Those roots have been, that growing zone has been limited because of the road. And then finally, let's look in this last picture. This is State Street, but it could be any downtown area of any city or village in Wisconsin. It's an area where it is all paved and we have these planting boxes, which we affectionately call planting tombs, where our trees are planted. And they're expected to grow here. Well, think back to that graph I showed in the beginning where I said the average lifespan of a tree was seven years. Well, maybe it's about 32 here and maybe it's about 60 some here and maybe it's about 150 over here. The point is, the closer we get to the way Mother Nature intended trees to grow, the longer living they are. So let's take that as a lesson and focus on mulch. Types of organic mulch that you can choose from, and again, organic meaning it used to be alive. Um, you got grass clippings, hardwood bark chips, composted leaf litter, manure, compost, peat moss, you, you can see the rest. For our trees, the best thing to use would be the bark or chips. In very creative and careful ways, the other things could be used too, but for the average homeowner, I would recommend using bark or chips. They've got that medium textured, um, they're fairly easy to use and affordable to get. To put on the mulch, you would cover the planting area at a depth of three to five inches, with the idea it's going to settle down to two to four. When you put it on the plant, you want to make sure it doesn't go up against the trunk of the plant. You want to leave the trunk of the tree unburied. Um, so think of a donut hole in your planting ring. The mulched area should extend to the drip line of the tree, or at least four to five feet from the trunk. The larger the area, the more beneficial. And that's the take home message. The larger the area of mulch you provide, the more beneficial it'll be for the tree in the long run. And mulch does break down. That's okay. Replenish it as necessary. Kind of alluded to some of this before. Mulch provides an insulation layer, so it protects those roots from extremes of heat and cold. It can also help conserve moisture underneath so things so moisture isn't lost entirely to evapor evaporation. As it breaks down, it can improve the soil's physical structure and fertility by giving off nutrients at a very low level. Because you have done digging here, you have exposed soil that you can prevent it from eroding. Um, but also, I have seen many situations where people are trying to grow grass very unsuccessfully under shade trees, and there's a lot of exposed soil. My suggestion is give it up, mulch it. And also, we're going to get the reduction of root competition, and this is root competition with turf grass. Turf grass and trees, eh, there's problems. Additional benefits of mulch, they keep the lawnmowers away. So if you've ever had somebody ding up the trunk of a tree by a lawnmower or weed whip, this is an easy way to correct that problem. If you have leaves or you do have a wood chipper, it gives you a place to grind up those materials and use them for uh way to recycle your own yard waste. And here's an aesthetic thing. Provides a more natural appearance to the landscape. That depends on how you do it. And it provides a favorable environment for earthworms and other organisms and other warm little fuzzy things that might get kids and other people out there into the garden. Disadvantages though. If you use a fine textured mulch like, oh 
grass clippings or finely shredded leaves or sawdust or stuff like that, it can get so compacted that it creates a barrier, barrier that makes it difficult for air and water to move in and out of the soil. And it could mean either trapping too much moisture or preventing oxygen from getting to the roots. Um, especially in the spring, those fine texture moistures, or excuse me, those fine texture mulches um, can trap excess moisture in the ground and can lead to root rots. So if you do have a heavy soil and are prone to root rots in the spring, you may want to pull back your mulch and let the soil dry out a bit with the idea that you push it back when the heat of summer comes around. Heat injury can occur to your plants if you're using dark colored mulches. Keep in mind they are sold in different dyes and colors and dark colors do attract heat. Well if mulch makes such a nice insulation most of the time if you put dark colored mulch on top of the roots of your plant and it starts to heat up I, I think you can get problems there um, depending on the specimen of plants that are, are affected. If you put it on too early in the spring your soils may not warm up as they should. If you put it on too early in the fall the soils may not cool down as they should. So I like to put down my mulch when soil temperatures are at a fairly stable point. Depending on where you get your mulch you may bring in weed seeds and um, it does break down so it needs to be replenished. Here's the chart I've been waiting to get to. I really like this chart. It's a nice summary of some tree research that was done by Gary Watson at the Morton Arboretum, which is just outside Chicago. In this study, he's looking at two different things. He's looking at the density of roots, the number of roots per square inch or per square foot, that occur when growing under turf versus under mulch. And he's also looking at how much sugar is stored in those roots in situations where the plant is fertilized at turf rate. So this means that on when you study turf section, um, there's a recommendation for like a thousand pounds of nitrogen, no, one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. So the turf is being fertilized at recommended rates or beyond that. So here we're looking at over the re recommended turf rates and how much sugars are in those roots. So looking at the study, first with turf versus mulch, he found that there were higher root densities on plants that were grown under mulch. There was lower root densities under turf. More roots under mulch, less under turf. This means that when mulch is present, the plant has more roots, more roots, more water and nutrient absorption, and the more likely the plant is to better take care of itself. Unfertilized versus fertilized, they found l lower, excuse me, comparing unfertilized to fertilized, there was lower carbohydrates, fewer sugars in the roots under fertilized than unfertilized. So unfertilized roots had more sugar stored in them those that are fertilized had less. Well, fertilizers applied are predominantly high in nitrogen. When you put down high nitrogen fertilizer on a tree, it's going to redirect its energy into green leafy growth. That green leafy growth is going to require sugars to happen. And in this case, it is when you are putting down excess fertilizer, high nitrogen fertilizer, the tree is going to take the sugars that it has stored in its roots and put that energy into growth it ne doesn't necessarily need, that it may not be able to support with its roots. It's also using up sugars that could help overcome potential stresses, like from insects or disease or droughts. So when we put down high nitrogen fertilizers on our tree, we are causing that tree to invest its sugars into growth it cannot support or doesn't necessarily need. And it's not necessarily a good thing for the plant. So as we look at this summary in a whole, in its entirety, 
the stereotypical way we as Americans grow trees is in the middle of the yard and we try really really hard to have beautiful green grass go right up to the base and whenever our plant encounters a problem what's our solution throw some fertilizer on it well what we're doing in that scenario is we're promoting fewer roots and by fertilizing as much as we do we're putting on growth that the plant cannot support and this is another contributing factor to the stress we keep seeing in our trees and why they're not living as long as what they should the scenario we need to be trying to achieve when growing our plants is having them mulched the way they want to be with mother nature and not over fertilizing them take home messages if you fertilize your grass you shouldn't need to fertilize most of your trees there are some special um, cases mostly due with soil ph but for the general nitrogen requirements that the plant needs if you fertilize your grass you're fertilizing your trees at a satisfactory rate the little mulch, little bit of mulch is good let's just note a lot more mulch can be bad we want wide rings we don't want to have this all piled up when this starts to get too high we start calling this a mulch volcano and we definitely don't want to bury that trunk so get in there pull that mulch back think donut holes here's an example at a botanic garden where the drip line or the area underneath the canopy of the tree has all been mulched uh, they look like little volcanoes but they're actually donuts um, and if you are tolerant of having these circles in your yard that is one option for you to do keep in mind you you can be creative and do beds such as the shrub bed um, this will bring you the same benefit but what we want to do is start to think of this as our final products minus the pie shaped um, wedge missing from it we want wide planting holes we want holes that put the root flare at the natural soil grade and we want to come in and mulch because what this is going to do is then create an area that's going to be very nice for roots to grow this doesn't mean though it needs to be void of all plants altogether because what else is at the base of the forest floor other plants and you can come in here with some perennials like hostas maybe some ornamental grasses um, a variety of other things that can go into here so it's not as if you are getting rid of more grass think of it as you're creating another planting bed and that is fine here's what we want to try to get away from this tree in the middle of the yard with no mulch um, hopefully you look at this now and, and cringe at how this tree is being reared tree wrap can be important it's very important when you're moving trees from point A to point B to kind of minimize the damage that can occur from shipping um, it's also useful in the fall and winter to protect trees from animal damage but remember remove it remove it during the growing season and pruning let's keep pruning minimal right now we want to let those trees get established um, and then we'll come in and do our training if there is any pruning to be done just do enough to remove any broken branches that may uh, occur um, we'll get into some of the major pruning work very very soon so just some pictures from my neighborhood um, here is down the road from me this river birch that has been planted out here in this spot as you see um, I swear this tree has not grown in 10 years um, on the sake of embarrassing myself here's my backyard it's so I still have snow on the ground so yeah it's not very pretty but this little tree I planted when I moved into the house and it was no bigger than two feet tall and in seven years it is now 30 feet tall what is hard to tell in this picture is is the only grass I have in my yard is this little strip right here this entire section back back on this hill is, is mulched in so to me that I I'm definitely a believer in, in mulch and proper planting and proper care for trees and what it can do here's another example from much longer ago um, this was done at Old Brick Botanical Gardens and, and they used two swamp white oaks purchased at the same time same size from the same nursery but planted in the two different styles one where it was too deep in the ball and burlap not mulch and the other one as as I explained 
and just after one growing season look at the difference between them. If we look at the color, this one looks sick, it looks like it's struggling compared to the other one which is dark green, it looks healthy. If we look at growth however, this is where we really see the difference and this even surprises me where this tree has not grown due to the stress that is under. After one year this guy has taken off and is growing to the part where it's off the screen. So for a quick summary, right plant, right place. Match the environment to the needs of the tree and work your landscape functions into that as well. Take the time to plant it correctly. Take 20 minutes to, to do it right. Or what's the other saying? Plant a $100 hole for a $5 tree, something on that. Be mindful of the roots. So much of their lives, they're out of our minds because they're out of sight. Um, but realize how important they are. Stake if necessary. Most of the time it is. Water, water, water. Water, 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 water. Water, water. Prune only broken disease branches at this time. We're going to get to pruning in a little bit. And remember, if you're fertilizing the grass, for the majority of the cases out there, you're providing your tree with enough fertilizer too.